Good morning. Welcome to the west end of Oak Island. <clears throat> We're down near Lockwood Folly Inlet, which we'll see in just a minute. Put on your sunscreen. Let's go down to the beach and have a little talk. If you've been watching my videos, you probably have noticed by now that I walk with a limp. I had a motorcycle accident when I was 35 that severely mangled my left leg. Many wonderful doctors, interns, nurses, f physicians, assistants, and physical therapists made it possible for me to keep and use that leg. If you're thinking that the Bible never talks about someone like me, today I have a surprise for you. But please bear with me as we back up a bit and give the story some context. When my wife and I married, we each had two teenage kids, one boy and one girl. Each of our two kids had completely opposite personalities. We were surprised to learn that you could have four kids when we blended our families that were completely different from one another. My point is that each pair of kids grew up in the same environment and had the same parents, yet they received their life experiences in their own unique way. You might say that they came out of the womb as who they would be. The Bible tells the story of Jacob coming out of the womb, hanging onto his brother's heel. That's even what his name means, he who grasps the heel. Jacob bribed his brother to give up his inheritance, tricked his dad into giving him Esau's blessings as well, and finagled a fortune out of his father-in-law. He was intelligent, ambitious, and used to being able to control any situation to get what he wanted. But after at least 14 years away from home, it was time to go back to the promised land and face the wrath of the brother he had so grievously wronged. He'd come up with a plan to butter up Esau with elaborate gifts. But on the eve of his first encounter with Esau, Jacob hung back and sought out solitude. It was there that a man showed up and started wrestling with Jacob, not really something one would expect to happen camping in the wilderness. They contended all night. Humanly speaking, the man couldn't overpower Jacob's dogged determination to hang on. So the mystery man tapped into his divine nature, touched Jacob's hip, and left him with a limp. The light bulb came on for Jacob and he refused to let go unless the mystery man blessed him. Uh, what is your name? The man asked, inviting Jacob to own who he was. My name is he who grasps the heel, Jacob. Then the man changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means one who struggled with God and with humans and has overcome. And then he blessed him there. The Apostle Paul looked at his unspecified thorn in the flesh this way. When I am weak, then I am strong. In the very place where we have struggled with God and people, in the very place where we are wounded and scarred, God blesses us with a strength not our own. Jesus had heard about how Herod beheaded John the Baptist. One way that I'm actually like Jesus is that when I need to process events in my life, I like to get out on the water. The Bible says Jesus withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. This wouldn't be the last time Jesus struggled with his mission to bring God's kingdom to us. We see it again on Gethsemane. What brought Jesus back into action? People, people who were hungry for his help, heard where he was and followed him there. I should confess that I get a bit irritated when my quiet time with God is interrupted. So I would understand it if Jesus had responded humanly to the crowds, disrupting his retreat by saying something like, can't you people see I'm being religious here? Get out of here and leave me alone. <laughs> but his disciples later described how Jesus actually reacted. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. The people came with their needs, but perhaps they were also 
God's answer to Jesus' own struggles. His compassion pulls him back into the action of building the kingdom of God among God's faithful. His attitude toward the people wasn't overwhelmingly contagious, however. His disciples had their own suggestion for what to do with all these people as the day wore on. Send them away to go buy their own food. Jesus is like, nah, you feed them. The disciples had already done the math. This crowd numbered in the thousands. The adult men alone numbered about 5,000. The disciples pointed out the weakness, the insufficiency of their inventory. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. And this is where the cycle of multiplied blessings began. Keep in mind, this isn't just a story about bread and fish. Bread was woven into the stories of faith. Unleavened bread at the Passover when God's people were liberated from Egypt. Manna in the wilderness as God's people traveled to the promised land. Isaiah's prophecy in which God promised to fill our thirst in a way that we could buy without money. It also looks forward to when Jesus broke the bread and gave thanks at the Last Supper. Jesus received the little that they had, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he took his uncomprehending disciples and pressed them into the service of sharing the bread and the fish there on the beach. Just as Jacob's wrestling man revealed who he was by touching Jacob's hip, Jesus now reveals who he is. The people we learn all ate and were satisfied. For people in that day to eat until they were full would have been, a, would have been significant in a way that's difficult for most of us Westerners to comprehend. I think of Louis C.K. saying that the meal isn't over when I'm full. The meal isn't over till I hate myself. Not only is it common for us to eat till we're full, we often continue to eat just for the pleasure of it. But that wasn't the case for the people on whom Jesus had compassion. Jesus took the blessing of the five loaves and two fish and thanked the source of the blessing for them. He shared the blessing with the 12 disciples who shared the blessing with the thousands of people whose needs were met. The disciples, who had been concerned about having too little to feed themselves, now found themselves each with a basket full of leftovers, 12 in all, a basket for each of them. G Jacob used every trick he knew, but found himself in fear for his very life. He wrestled with God and man. He was scarred, he limped, but he received God's blessings. Jesus was upset that John the Baptist had been beheaded, but when he saw the people, he had compassion, served them with the blessing he had available. When the people were hungry, Jesus and the disciples took the meager blessings they had and shared them, and the blessings were multiplied beyond our imagination. I don't understand the dark valley, the shadows that have been cast over your life, how is it that your weaknesses reveal themselves in a limp or some other way? I don't know how meager the gifts that you have to share might be, but if you can see your weakness, your dependence, your need, you are in a better position to be used by God than anyone who thinks that they can handle life alone. In our weakness, we find a way to share the bread that can feed thousands, even if we don't understand how that works. May God help us not to see our shortcomings as excuses not to serve, but instead as an opportunity to see what great things God can really do when we entrust Him with however little it is that we have to share. Mm -hmm.